Good morning. Um, so, um, I will be talking today about this. I've shrunk the title to fit on the slide. Evaluating the display of glyphs. This is a data science visualization problem in uh, urban uh, environments. I just want to thank Newcastle, the Alan Turing Institute in London, who pay for about two thirds of my time, and Curtin University in Perth, where I did a little bit of this work before Christmas in December. So the data set that we're working with is data from Newcastle itself. Um, we have the world's largest open data source about a city collected from over 600 sensors across Newcastle. Uh, and it's been collecting data for about the last four years. There's nearly 1.4 billion data readings about the city now. And it collects at a rate between 6,500 and 7,000 readings per minute. Um, these cover all sorts of things about the city, noise, weather, traffic, air quality, beehive weight, water flow, all sorts of things. Um, we'll only take out of this temperature from the sensors because we're just worried about the visualization, but we're often trying to visualize many things at once. In order to help us um, visualize data about the city and to try and engage people in the visualizations, one of the things we're doing is building a 3D digital twin of Newcastle at quite high resolution with quite uh, accurate models of the buildings in the city, the trees, the parking spaces, the street lights, all sorts of things. This picture is an 8,000 by 8,000 picture of the area of 16 square kilometers we're working with so far. In a couple of months, we'll have expanded this out to 80 square kilometers, which covers the area of most of the sensors that we're, we're using data from. We use as a rendering engine Blender, and we render using the highest quality that Blender has, the Cycles Path Tracer. So it takes a while to render these pictures. The biggest image we've drawn was a trillion pixels using 1,000 NVIDIA CPUs, GPUs, um, which rendered the trillion pixel version of this in about uh, 40 minutes. But that's not really the subject of today's talk. Um, what we're very interested in is, is how do we add data to the city so that people can understand what's happening in the city as it changes in various events. Um, how does the air quality change at different times of the year? We're doing a study at the moment on how air quality changes over Christmas and New Year as the traffic flows through the city change. Um, we're also interested in a similar thing for civilian and military tactical decision making. We have a few projects on that as well. Each of these glyphs, these circle target shapes, are 3D pins on the map, you'll see in a minute. And they show, what, uh, in this image, one hour averages of temperature across the city. The constant color in the disk is usually related to the temperature. Uh, in the study today, we're going to use two glyph shapes, a circle and a trefoil shape. Um, the trefoil will be a target shape, which we'll be looking for. And they're designed around the Land-Alt-C optotypes used in vision tests to have a certain ratio that 20% of the diameter is a target. The center disk is the, is the information carrying value color. You can see at the bottom some of the design issues that we have. How do you put these things into the city? Um, do you rotate the target so it always faces the camera, or do you leave it flat? Various options there that we're working away at to work out how it um, should fit together. <coughs> so the question, we've been working on this three or four years now, and the question we're coming to at last is, is it worth doing this in stereo? Are, are there data visualization benefits from using stereo in large city visualizations? Um, both in task performance terms, but also in engagement, people's engagement uh, in the work. Previous studies, such as uh, John McIntyre's study in 2014, has shown a range of tasks that benefit from stereo. And one of them is visual search tasks. So visual search, very similar to the things that we'll be testing today. Finding something in a scene, finding some oddity or, or sensor uh, change in the scene. There's also biological evidence and evolutionary evidence that that might be a good idea. Um, the brain can segment targets from a scene binocularly without needing to recognize them separately monocularly. Um, <coughs> we did a study a few years ago on x-ray screening in airports and you can join together occluded parts of a shape to see the whole shape and that helped uh, performance uh, in um, airport screening. And there's some evidence that is evolutionary suggesting that search, visual search, is one of the main evolutionary drivers for stereo vision, rather than grasping and reaching for things. So, uh, we and Colin Ware and others have done various 
tests in the past of what stereo vision can and can't do, and to get an idea of quantifying how much performance benefit can you get from stereo, um, we've, we did these graph tasks where you had a couple of nodes in the graph and you had to find out if they were joined by only one other node. And the more complex the graph is, the more difficult this task gets. We found in this case that this speeds up about 10% for this task in stereo displays. And Colin Ware found about 50% speed up for these tasks using a stereo display. So trying to gather evidence why it would be useful to use stereo for the, the new tasks we're looking at. So we've got some uh, two particular tasks that we've evaluated in this study. The one on the top is uh, just a set of glyphs arranged in a, a grid. One of them you'll see is a trefoil shape, that's the target shape. Um, and for this task, the search task is to look for the trefoil shape and answer yes or no if it's present or absent in the scene. In the second scene, we've put the same glyph designs into the map, representing the sensor positions. Um, and in that one, I'll say a bit more later, there are three glyphs with a trefoil shape and you have to identify those within the scene. In order to design this to work, um, we've had to design the glyphs in certain ways. So one of the things we were looking at is the saliency of the glyphs, and we did um, calculations on when the glyphs stand out from the rest of the scene. Um, the top image on your left was our original city image. The bottom image was the one we went with in the trials, because as you can see on the right, the glyphs on the right stand out are very salient in that scene, whereas in the top, you can't see the saliency of them at all. So that adjusts luminance and color saliency of the glyphs for us. We also had to look at the feature size in the glyphs. Could you actually see the glyph shapes in the, um, in the um, target images? Uh, and one of the problems is that very rarely in visualizations do people worry about calculating shape and whether it's visible or not. They'll just give you a shape and hope you'll be able to see it. So we, on our target display, which was this Optima projector, projected at 40 inches, and calculated glyph size. And if you see those two little green glyphs just under the picture, that's the smallest size that would work on this display for you to be able to uh, separate these two glyphs. And we're using glyph sizes to the same scale, much bigger than that. So the, the, the 2D size is fine. Similarly, we need to worry about whether or not the rate of change in depth of glyphs would be too much for you to distinguish between glyphs at different depths. Uh, luckily, as is often the case, Marty Banks did a study in 2014 about this and came that the rate of depth variation that you can cope with is three cycles per degree. I don't have time to go through the maths as, as why, but on the right, our glyphs repeated a rate of just one cycle per degree, so well above the limit, the threshold limit for um, you being able to distinguish changes in depth between the glyphs. Okay, Dan, could you switch to 3D? And can someone turn the lights right down to really dark? I'm afraid our images are a bit dim. dim, dim. <coughs> okay, when you're ready. So hopefully, so this is the first image. You can see the glyphs within the city. You can see the 3D structure of the city. Near the bottom of the front is Blackfriars, an old monastery and our excellent restaurant. At the top of this scene is Newcastle United Premiership Football Club, some of you may know of. Uh, and these are real sensor positions showing uh, temperature for a certain time of day a few years ago. OK, next image, please. So this is our first trial, and the task here is to find whether there's a trefoil shape in there. This is a monoscopic version. Next image. This should be the stereo version, and the only difference here is there's a depth between the glyphs and the background. And then we're going to test a depth highlighted version, which is the next image down. Well, you should see the trefoil shape is pulled out in front of the rest of the glyphs. So those are the three conditions we'll do in the trial. And the same if you go to the next one down. For the city map, this is the 2D version. Go to the next one. And you'll see the glyphs are within the city. So they're within the, the urban canyons of the city. They're not, we haven't pulled them out. If you go to the next one, we, we use depth highlighting to highlight the target trefoil shaped glyphs. And again, they're the three conditions we'll use. I'm just going to show you a couple more images now, because we're not going to do 3D again. Um, so Lucy McLaughlin, who works with me, has been working on 
street lights at night. I don't know how well that will come out for you. But we're putting all the f street lights in their physical positions and looking at nighttime lighting of the city to try and give people a, a, a visual impression of what time of day we're measuring the different sensors at. If you go to the next one, you'll see this same similar view with the glyphs in, in place. All done with path tracing. You have to use path tracing to get this type of, of image. OK, back to uh, presentation. Thank you, Dan. So this is the first experiment that we did. Um, the grid of glyphs with the trefoil shape in random positions in monoscopic, stereoscopic, and stereoscopic with depth highlighting. There's eight possible variations of all these variables. In these pilot studies, we're not really exploring them all. Um, and we also use just three expert participants to do this. We're aiming to try and get an idea of if it's worth doing more experiments from this study. So these are the results from experiment one. Um, for various reasons, we're using non-parametric tests for this, um, the Mann Whitney U test. Um, so the first line is the comparison of the monoscopic versus the stereoscopic view of this grid of glyphs. There's no significant difference in people's ability to identify the target glyph here, uh, and there's no negligible effect in this, in this trial. So stereo versus mono, it's just as fast. However, if you go to the next line down, when you see it's stereo and the glyphs, the trefoil glyphs are highlighted in depth in front of the other glyphs, you then start to see a performance benefit from this. Uh, and you get about a 10% effect size, 10% speed up from people, and a very significant and a medium effect size when you study the effect size. And the final one is comparing the monoscopic view with the stereoscopic view with the depth highlighting. And there we get a better 15% effect size more significant result, uh, but still medium effect size. We're a bit careful about judging this as being a definitive result, but there were only three participants in this trial. So, monoscopic versus stereoscopic, no performance advantage. If you add in something that is a depth judgment, we get a performance advantage, and more so when there's more of a depth judgment involved, it seems. So having done that in a quite a crowded artificial abstract environment, we want to test that within the city model, the 3D model. Um, and again, we did stereoscopic or monoscopic and with and without the depth highlighting. And in this case, you'll see at the bottom, the depth highlighting was bringing the target glyphs above the height of most of the buildings in the city. So they're at a significantly different depth. Again, same three expert participants, um, each viewed about uh, 80 image each. Um, anyone who's a psychophysicist I can't see any, that's good. We'll immediately question this experiment. We had people count the three glyphs, the three target trefoil glyphs, and that was the only task they did. There was no forced choice here. So they had to be very honest that they counted the glyphs and then pressed, yes, I've counted them. They could have just gone, yeah, 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 yeah without even counting them. But it, analyzing the results, I think they did the trial as expected. And then next one. Um, Monoscopically, again, mono versus stereo, there's not really any significant difference in this and negligible effect size. Compare stereo with and without this depth highlighting, there's an effect size, and using depth lets you identify these targets, count these three targets, about 20% faster in the stereoscopic condition. And if you compare the monoscopic condition with the stereoscopic condition with depth highlighting, you get slightly more performance, 22% improvement in speed. So we're not seeing a big advantage mono stereo, but as soon as you have depth in the task again, there's an advantage, a speed up for you. So these are pilot experiments. We're trying to work out, is it worth putting the effort into stereoscopic production for our visualizations? Um, there's no measured performance advantage over using a stereoscopic display over a monoscopic display, but when you introduce the depth highlighting, the stereo starts to have an advantage. So this is broadly in line with previous work. You have to ask the question, is a 0.4 second speed up really worth it, even if it's significant? Is that really worth it for people? Or are there situations where the stereoscopic viewing becomes essential? And if you go back to our original picture, 
where the glyphs were not very salient. It might be if we do the depth highlighting in that picture, we'll get a much more significant difference between mono and stereo. So going to the future, we've just ordered a DRV Z1 3D display. We're going to run a set of more robust trials and test this over the next year. I should say many thanks to Lucy McLaughlin and Mike Simpson, who both helped in all of the modeling and uh, work behind this. Thank you.